Bon, mais bon après-midi à uh, tout le monde. Uh, welcome everyone. We're very happy to uh, to see you today. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, for joining us. And um, well, today you're going to tell us a little bit more about your projects, NGO to protect the environment in uh, in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And um, we can speak English today and French. Donc, si vous avez des questions en français uh, à la fin de la rencontre, n'hésitez pas. On va voir ce qui vient organiquement. Um, so, Jonathan, could you please tell us a little bit more about your uh, your project, about your background? Uh, I think that your story is quite fascinating. Where do you come from and why did you start protecting the environment? Cool. Thanks, Mariette. And also, big thanks to Age of Union. Um, thanks for having me here. It's a real pleasure coming from Trinidad and also knowing that you guys have also put your feet down in Trinidad and recently begun supporting work there. I know your announcement is coming up. but. Uh, so yeah, so my background is I'm, I'm a civil engineer, specialized in soils, water, environment. Um, and I actually studied in Montreal at McGill University. And uh, I worked for several years here for a large Canadian firm. Uh, you know, and I got to, I, it's, it was an incredible experience. I worked alongside amazing people, but it was in the mining industry. So I did get, you know, exposed to the, to the big impacts of mining. I did work on good projects, I have to say. I've seen how mining can be done sustainably, but I did also see the difficult and damaging side of it. Um, specifically, where I worked in, uh, I worked in Panama, and I saw 10,000 acres of virgin rainforest mm -hmm. being taken down to build what was, you know, a really large copper mine. So that experience was really challenging. But anyway, so it's just to say that that particular, that really was the sort of shifting moment in my life, you know. I, I was already looking for green engineering solutions, searching all my time looking for green engineering solutions, and I discovered this plant, Vetive grass, which you'll hear a bit more about today. But uh, when, I, when I discovered it, we have a little saying in Trinidad, it's kind of used around um, cuckoo a lot. So the cuckoo, the cuckoo industry, we have a lot of chocolate, but people kind of say, the cuckoo jumbi took me, you know? I don't know if you guys know what jumbi means, but it's a kind of like a spirit, you know? So they kind of say the cuckoo spirit took me and people got into the cuckoo industry. But I kind of make a joke and I say like, the veti ve jumbi took me, uh, just because as soon as I learned about it in, Mo in Montreal, I was actually here working, but I, I couldn't stop studying it and I kind of got all the books and the manuals and learned all about it. Um, the roots grow very deep, 10 feet deep in the first two years. So, I'll just, and uh, I guess you were asking me for the background, I'll just end, end that uh, response in terms of saying that, um, yeah, basically, well, I, I discovered that plant and I was promoting it in the company that I worked in um, in Canada. And uh, that kind of, I think that passion and wanting to be part of the restoration, it kind of led me to be part of the erosion and sediment control team in Panama. Uh, but that's where I saw this sort of big disruption taking place, a lot of rainforests getting taken down. And it was during that time that I really kind of, had this back and forth, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, do I stay, do I go? Am I gonna stay in this industry? Kind of being off, you know, having the next opportunities to go somewhere else, or do I move on? And, and, uh, and really and truly, I felt, uh, yeah, just a really big call towards environment, climate, con uh, conservation, that sort of thing. So it really was this kind of decision to kind of leave that behind and commit, am I gonna commit my life to environment, climate change, conservation, that type of stuff. Yeah. So you um, basically were an engineer, you saw deforestation, you saw uh, the impact of mining in the environment, and you realized that that's not possible. We have to protect the environment. And so you discovered this plant, and just so you guys can, can imagine, so how tall is it? Should uh, we look at my size? Is it? Uh, the roots? The roots. They're a lot yeah. taller. A yeah, lot. Yeah. So the roots are yeah. a lot taller than me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So why is it important uh, for? Why the roots are so important? Because you know, maybe people don't un don't know why a root could be that important for the environment to restore an environment or to protect uh, the soil. Could you explain a little bit more technically what's happening? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So yeah, so so most grasses, the roots are really shallow, like just one to two feet deep. Uh, so this is a really unique plant species. The same way we have a lot of different plant species with unique characteristics, like bamboo. Like we hear a lot about bamboo, and we know what bamboo can do, and that type of thing. Um, hemp is another one you know that people talk a lot about. 
but so the vetiver is just a unique plant. And truthfully, I've, I've really come to believe that all plants are unique and have their little thing, but vetiver definitely is a unique one. Uh, and its roots can grow up to 10 feet deep in the first two years. Uh, so again, you were standing up and showing, but it's deeper than that. And actually, there was there have been sort of experiments to grow them deeper, even like, like in the Caribbean in Barbados recently. And I have pictures I could show, you know, but there's a, um, there's a case where it's like, 15 feet deep, 20 feet deep, like it's being held up in the air. So again, most grasses, it's one to two feet deep, but what makes it better unique is it goes very deep, and therefore, it makes it a really powerful tool for land stabilization, to hold land, um, prevent erosion, protect infrastructure, so it can protect roads, homes, houses, um, and that's a really important thing, you know, like uh, in the Caribbean, Due to climate change, uh, there is a lot of you know increased weather events, much heavier rainfall, bigger storms. So during um, Hurricane Maria, which took place in Dominica a couple of years ago, there's an estimated 10,000 landslides. You know that was with satellite imagery, and people's houses go, roads go. Um, we even think of like there's even bigger parts of the world, even like I, I think sometimes about Brazil. You know, like the favelas, and you see big landslides that take place. And then Haiti, you know, um, Haiti is a place that are, yeah. well, you know, so, so anyway, so the, the, the Valley Vega grass, I guess, can serve as an important role for all of those types, a lot of those types of functions. So do you mean that having vetiver grass around houses, but also in the fields, like in different places, could actually help with the erosion, meaning that when there are um, lots of rain, it would not slide as much? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's, that's, that's exactly it. So it's actually, it's a green infrastructure tool. Mm. So I'm, a, I'm a, um, again, as I mentioned, I'm a civil engineer specialized in soils, water, environment. Mm -hmm. So it really can be used in that way. So in Trinidad, um, uh, I wound up moving back there in 20, 2013, 14, mm -hmm. and I, found, I co founded an NGO, a nonprofit organization mm -hmm. called I Am Movement, mm -hmm. which has become one of the leading civil society voices on climate change. So we hosted the People's Climate Marches in 2014, 2015, during the key UN summits in New York and Paris. And Trinidad is also a big fossil fuel producer. So it was really difficult to start the conversation at that time. Because you're, sp you're speaking about climate change, but pretty much everybody has a, a friend, a cousin, a dad, an uncle, someone who works in the oil and gas industry. You know, So it's kind of... Speaking about that was is quite difficult because people will be like, "Hey, like, <laughs> what are you doing?" <laughs> you know. But what's been really interesting is we did actually. I won't get into that stuff now. That's a whole other discussion about energy and that type of thing because we we do a lot of that work in Trinidad as well. Um, but it is interesting to see that there is. Uh, yeah, again, I won't go there right now. But the point is that I guess I also started a company called Vetiver TT Ecological Engineering Solutions Limited. And that makes use of the same vetiver grass. And we offer it as a private solution. So we actually, um, I mean, now we do it for communities throughout Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean. So we've gotten the right development partners to help us take it to communities across Trinidad and Tobago and a couple other Caribbean islands uh, to do it through an approach which is called the Vetiver Education and Empowerment Project. So it's like VEEP, it's a model that we started in 2016 and have since replicated around Trinidad and a couple other islands. But it's just to say that it has this actual um, economic value, you know? Like, instead of building a wall, you can plant vetiver grass instead of putting rock baskets. So the company, we are able to save clients a lot of money, you know? Um, we, in some cases, we're, we're helping community people who are just actually scared that their house is going to fall down, uh, providing this solution. But... Um, uh, you know, but then there are people who, yeah, I guess, they, I guess so we sometimes do it for free, but then there might even be persons who've saved up for a wall. They've saved a lot of money for a wall, and we can come in and do something cheaper. And then there's a straight-up commercial approach of, of actually saving big companies. Instead of a, a $100,000 retaining wall, we can do a solution for $20,000, $30,000. Um, our biggest case was actually 1.5 million US or something, and our solution was about 100000 Um but anyway, so it's just really to say that it can be, it has that capability of serving as, a, as an actual green infrastructure tool, you know? Uh, so when we went to, uh, to Trinidad and we met you, we went to uh, visit your quarry, uh, a sand quarry that basically we're expecting, I was expecting just uh, dunes of, of sand and bare soil. And we realized that you actually started this 
a reforestation project where the water, river, ecosystem would come back. So how is it possible from a, a bare soil, from sand, to actually grow back, um, grow back a forest? Yeah, yeah. So I guess just a little quick background on that project, basically. It was because of that uh, same model I mentioned, the, the VET Vetiver Vet Education Empowerment Project approach, which had been really successful in terms of bringing the Vetiver grass to our biggest hillside farming community in Trinidad. Uh, so the model was kind of established there successfully and we began working with key partners like the UNDP, uh, Small Grants Program, um, and they recognize our sort of model and our capability of kind of going into communities and working with communities. Mm -hmm. And so they knew that they, there was a, a certain initiative that was taking off or taking place in Trinidad and Tobago called IWECO, um, Integrating Water um, Land Ecosystems. It was a Caribbean project with the UN Environmental Program. Um, but basically, we, were, we came in and we were originally bringing in the Veti Vegras approach of kind of its use for the land stabilization, erosion, that kind of thing. But in terms of restoring quarries, we had to think about what how else can we do this, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, there was actually past efforts to, to restore where they planted trees. And you can see these trees that were planted four years before, and they were just a foot high. They, they're not growing at all because there's no topsoil. So if you really want to kind of bring back land, you have to think about regenerating the soil. Um, otherwise, nothing will grow. So we kind of recognize that um, by capturing organic waste, we could, uh, we could send the organic waste there instead of to the landfills. And um, this waste could be in the form of tree cuttings, debris, even um, carob spent grain, you know, from the breweries. So if you like bears, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of um, grain that gets produced. Um, and then even sargassum seaweed. You know, so that's like another input that, um, that can come in. But so it, it, I have to say that it takes a lot of work to figure out the logistics of all of that, kind of capturing the waste from all over the country and sending it there. So there's a lot of work in terms of getting this model to work successfully. But instead of channeling this waste to the landfills where it takes up space, produces methane, we can send it to the quarry, spread it out, and it pretty much in four months, everything is green again, you know? So you're mentioning that you are taking uh, uh, the waste, but also sargassum. Sargassum, for the people who don't know, uh, this is uh, a seed that uh, started growing up it, uh, in like uh, a huge amount in the sea, and uh, that was pushed in the, on the on the beach. And it's a very big problem uh, for the turtles who cannot nest anymore. Sargassum is taking over the whole beach, and the, the turtles cannot uh, cannot get into the beach to uh, to nest. So it's a big problem. So what you're telling me here that's so interesting is that actually there is a solution to take that sargassum that is an effect of side effect of climate change and take it and actually turn it into something positive to build up topsoil to uh, build up a forest from there, right? Yep, yep. So it's a regenerate land, yeah. Okay. And, um, and so Sagasam is one of those examples of this organic waste, which is just a nuisance and is causing a problem that, you can, that we can take and mm -hmm. close the loop, as we see, because we've developed a model now in Trinidad that's called Close the Loop. And it's all about closing the loop on systems or waste, uh, taking waste that could be, you know, is obviously um, normally creating damaging effects on the environment mm -hmm. and channeling it to good. So sargassum seaweed, like you said, is a. Uh, it's being. We're seeing it a lot more in the Caribbean now in the last five years, um, and obviously the Caribbean depends a lot on tourism. That's really important, and a lot of the other islands, it's more important, and their beaches are now being covered with sargassum seaweed. Uh, you see it in Mexico a lot as well, and they're trying to find solutions for it. Um, but it does affect the turtles um, and the nesting, their ability to kind of come on the beach and nest. So yeah, you basically have this big waste source that can be used as a, as a, as a solution. Um, not by itself, like it is really important to sort of have the other, that's where a bit of science comes in, in terms of the different proportions of different types of waste and that type of stuff. Um, but absolutely. What do you do with the salt of the, of the weed? We would think that nothing can grow from something that is salty, right? Yeah, no, that's, a, that's a really good question. So, um, I mean, if you just sprinkle, if you just use a, a thin layer of it, then it's okay, because it's not too much. So if you kind of include that with the other forms of waste. Mm -hmm. But 
if you if you want to use it as a main source, then it, it really sort of that's where it requires the process of, of how we're going to do this whole thing logistically, you know. So it might be a matter of having to harvest the sargassum and then have it laid out somewhere and sit down for a season and let the or several months let the rain wash mm -hmm. through it and the, the rain will wash out the salt. So it's sort of a passive approach um, mm -hmm. rather than kind of taking it and trying to wash it, and then you can take it there. So all of that is kind of what we're currently doing in terms of developing the systems for it mm -hmm. to work in a large scale, but efficiently, um, yeah, pretty much to work in a, a large scale and it, for it to be scalable, you know, for what we're doing to be scalable mm -hmm. and to capture these things in scale and convert and transform land positively at scale. Mm -hmm. So it seems that the, the vetiver grass is uh, working in the ground, that the topsoil you're creating uh, with the waste and, um, and, um, and the seed, the seaweeds, then it's working on the topsoil, so on the top. And, and so it's interesting that you're working on, on the different spheres of the, of the ground to regenerate the, what, what you need to create a forest, right? Yep, yep, absolutely. So obviously like a key part of it is all of that soil regeneration aspects, but mm -hmm. then of course planting trees is a mm -hmm. critical part as well, you know. Mm -hmm. So we do have like nurseries and um, community members that have been trained and we're able to kind of source plants from the forest mm -hmm. as in little saplings and put them in, in, in sealing bags. And, um, okay. and uh, obviously we'll be, we also have gotten um, from other sources too. So like mm -hmm. forestry division and stuff has provided trees. Um, but we're kind of getting ready to scale the nurseries and the tree production because mm -hmm. we're going to need a lot of trees as well. Mm -hmm. So it's just to say that with the, 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 the land regeneration aspect, using sagasam, using the organic waste and all that is a key part of preparing the land and getting it ready. But then to effectively reforest, we then need to kind of deploy the trees, you know? So it'll kind of have it all happening together at the same time. And vetiver is fully integrated from the standpoint of wherever there's serious erosion, um, you know? But also, I mean, we currently have studies taking place with the University of the West Indies. Mm which are looking at the different functions of vetiver. So there's a lot of things that are known, but in order for it to be really adopted in a really big way by, um, by say, community, I mean, I, 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 um, I see we have some trainees in the audience, I think, that just walked in. Is that right or not? <laughs> but, um, okay. But, um, but yeah, you know, just, it's just really to say that uh, to, so for, for, for new things to take off and be accepted, they really require local case studies as well as also there's a lot of respect for like local academia. And um, if we sort of have sort of studies coming, you know, out in the Caribbean, that it, it might be sort of more easily appreciated and, and picked up because there's a lot of these studies have been done internationally, you know, so there is already the academia behind this showing some of these things. Mm -hmm. But so with the university, we have certain studies taking place, such as looking at um, vetiver as a, as a companion species. Mm -hmm. Because the roots grow deep, it actually can bring up water mm -hmm. um, from deeper depths. And what they've observed is that mm -hmm. trees planted next to vetiver are growing a lot faster mm -hmm. as compared. But it's been done more observationally. We're kind of doing it more academically. And then it's also a C4 plant, meaning it takes in more carbon than most plants, which are C3. Mm -hmm. So the leaves are very strong. Um, most grasses, if you take the leaves and you cut them within three weeks, it'll sort of just disappear. But um, vetiver makes an excellent mulch. So you can kind of chop and drop on the ground around trees and keeps moisture in. And I guess I'll also just mention that because of the leaves' strength, they're also used to make other things. They're used to make handicrafts, baskets, mats, chairs, etc. And also, traditionally in the past, they were used in a, in a cob or tapia building. So the old buildings were used 100 years ago. They were made from mud. Vetiver leaves were kind of used as the fiber within the, within the walls. Um, it was also called bedding grass because the leaves were used to make beds and mattresses. Um, it's also called cockroach grass <laughs> because the, the, roots are, the roots have a fragrance. Cockroach is not a, I want to say, um, I guess, yeah, you guys have cock cock cockroaches up here. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, yeah, the point is the roots actually have a fragrance. They used to make essential oils and perfumes, and they keep away insects, you know? So there's a lot of different sort of um, uses of it. Um, but yeah, I guess that was a bit of a tangent with regards to the quarry rehabilitation and the use of Eddie there. Yeah. And do you know if this system is used in Canada? 
Um, so vetiver grass can't grow in Canada. It can grow everywhere in the tropical and subtropical world, which is still really important. It covers the whole belt of, of uh, Micronesia, um, bigger countries such as China as well, parts of it. It is used in the southern US, um, throughout the Caribbean, South America. Um, but it's not in North America. But there are other species, you know, and um, I haven't worked with them yet, but we have learned about other plants, other species, that the roots grow very deep, and we're really sort of interested and, and excited to explore that mm -hmm. in Canada and North America as well. Mm -hmm. So do you have any advice you could give to uh, someone who is, you know, where you were a few years ago, being an engineer, working in the mining industry, and having this burst of, I have to do something for the environment, it cannot go, keep going like that. What would you say to someone who's like in that moment of asking themselves questions like, I want to change, I want to start a change, I want to take care of the environment, but I feel too small, I feel too little, I don't know where to start, it's too big for me, what would, what would you say? Yeah, gosh, <laughs> it's a big question. Um, but yeah, I guess I would say, so not even just in the mining industry, because I think a lot of people are asking themselves these questions about in their lives, in their work, like, am I happy? Is this what I want to do? Um, you know, and they're asking themselves, is it fulfilling? Also, is it good? Is it having positive or negative effects on the environment, on people, and that type of thing? So people do want to make changes, but it's, uh, I think it's easier to do it in a slower way, <laughs> I guess. So I, I just mean to say that I, I have actually given a little bit of this advice before, um, and I would generally kind of say, don't jump off the deep end, <laughs> you know? It is kind of what I did, but it felt a bit hard, you know? Kind of making that leap 100%. And I do remember when I was working there, I really asked myself, like, what would I do if I didn't have to think about money in the morning when I woke up, and what would I want to be doing with my life? But at the same time, we're doing, like, these 40 hour weeks and we're thinking we have no more time, you know, and that's why when it's done, we don't want to do anything else. But when you kind of start to go off on your own tangent or your own initiative, you're probably going to be working six hour weeks or 70 hour weeks for a while. Obviously, eventually you kind of find that balance again. But it's just to say you're going to be working a lot. So rather than kind of making this big immediate um, I guess, jump, which can be a bit scary sometimes, you know, you can actually think, what do I want to do? And maybe you can start just investing some time towards it. So it can be small efforts. It could start as a hobby. Um, you can sort of uh, think about creating a side business. You can spend time in a sort of a decent way, but at the same time, not, um, not scaring yourself by leaving the securities that we, we kind of all need to, to, to sort of ca uh, carry on. Um, yeah, and then, and then at some point, you know, you might start to see successes and you might start to see yeah, growth and then you might be able to actually make that leap fully, you know, and begin to work on something full time that you like and love. So I guess rather than, uh, you know, it's just to say you can do it slowly rather than feeling like you need to do it all at once. Because um, sometimes doing it, taking that big leap can be a bit scary and can put stresses on us as people, you know, we're people as well and we need to take care of ourselves. So, yeah, I guess that's kind of a, just a general bit of encouragement that I would give. Slowly and maybe strategically. Yeah. Make your research, get to know what you're interested by. Do you want to be a volunteer? Do you want to start your own uh, NGO? What interests you? So. Yeah, 100%. And, and actually, it's, it's good to mention volunteering, because volunteering is a great way to just connect and um, begin getting exposed to, to all these types of stuff because you know you can do it just with your extra time, but then you really get integrated with the activities that are happening out there in the field. Um, you begin to learn, you might meet new people, you might see new opportunities that come up. So volunteering is really great. And actually with the NGO we have in Trinidad, we do get a lot of people asking us um, to volunteer. But of course, you know, volunteering does, even sort of managing volunteers, does take effort and work and time. So it's something that we haven't been able to sort of facilitate in a really big way as yet. We have some big events and a lot of volunteers come and they have a great time. But we want to sort of, um, we want to sort of make it possible for volunteers to kind of volunteer more kind of full time. And it's really exciting because I think we are getting to that place of being able to create a space uh, specifically, even like along the lines of nurseries for pr producing trees and stuff, but where people can come and volunteer in a continual way 
and um, and gradually get exposed. So hopefully we can support the growth of kind of volunteering and volunteerism in Trinidad as well. With the um, sargassum use, the organic waste, um, it seems that you managed to close the loop, as you were saying, but it seems that also with the community, you managed to involve the community. It's like you've got the whole scale with your project of, of using what's there, uh, what are the side effects of climate change that you can take into your advantage to actually regrow uh, regrow the land and how you can get the community involved because of course we want to help our country we want to help like where we live and, and participate so I feel it's very inspiring and beautiful that is beautiful in your project yeah yeah absolutely no the community needs to be involved 100% you know I mean um, a lot of the times the communities are the ones that um, they have the traditional old ways that we need to, um, yeah, that we need to go back to, you know? So just by, by working with them, we can learn and we can integrate. Um, and yeah, so it's 100% based in working with communities, the work we do, yeah. Yeah, and I guess I was, I was gonna mention just that the, it's a bit geeky and academic, so maybe I won't bother, but yeah, there's something called ecosystem-based adaptation which is um, something that's being recognized more and more. Um, and really and truly, it's just a sort of, um, yeah, recognizing that as we adapt to the realities of, of climate change, that we need to uh, work with our ecosystems and people are part of the ecosystems, you know? So it's really 100% necessary that we in, in, include and integrate people into those um, ecosystems. And as we give to the ecosystems and take care of them, they give, they give back to us and we can get ecosystem services, such as whether it is tourism, you know, or fish, or, uh, you know, um, water, et cetera. So it's just a certain um, model, or it's being recognized in a bigger way now and promoted. And we've been part of a project like that in the Caribbean. Um, and yeah, it's definitely part of, a, a core part of our work, I would say. Very inspiring, thank you. Um, I'd like to open to uh, questions, if there are any questions for Jonathan. Tu peux aussi demander en français, hein? pas de problème. <laughs> I just want to like, go a little bit more details. You mentioned that those roots, they help in the soil, because like I said, the erosion problems like for heavy rain, that happens also in Brazil, where they do you know, the sliding of uh, earth like on the, the soil. How does it really like, how, how is the research about this? Like, you know, how much, what's the probability like, okay, that it might help like poor communities, like, you know, having it around to use as an infrastructure to help the foundation of the soil. So it, like to reinforce it, like, and prevent this to happen. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. So it is, um, you know, it is, uh, let's just say working with plants is a non-exact science. So it's not the same as like building a, a steel and concrete wall and you could exactly calculate you know, the strength and um, steel concrete and all that. Um, so, which is also, I think, why it's not been widely, you know, it's not been the first go-to. I think for a long time, we have been really just excited and um, blinded by the lights, I like to say, in terms of thinking that steel and concrete and all these man-made solutions are always the best. Um, but those, you know, but at the same time, it's, it's very much a structural solution, you know? So the roots are very deep, and like, and like I said, the, there's a lot of academia behind it. And they've actually shown that the roots are five to seven times stronger than the roots of most other of grass species. So in terms of the actual tensile strength. Um, so yeah, 75 megapascals is kind of more or less what the, I guess I'm getting a bit technical here, you know, but it is. But, but anyway, so just to say that there really is a lot of study and work that's done behind it and, and to show that it can be used for those things. There was actually a software, so, so in the world, in, in, in engineering, um, when, you're doing with, when you're dealing with soils, again, it's not exactly the same as, as steel and concrete, but at the same time, in our traditional engineering, even like to build this building, you know, we have to do engineering in the foundations and, and analyze the soils or if we're doing dams. So it is, even soils are a non-exact science you know, that require a certain level of interpretation. Um, and uh, there is a, so there's actually, so we use softwares in, um, for soil engineering and, and land stabilization. 
And that's traditional, that's mainstream, that's used by all the big companies in Canada, that's, that's a given, you know? But there has been efforts to actually create software using Vetive, like integrating it into the, into the analyses. That was done by a company in Italy that was trying to do that. Um, it, wasn't it wasn't done successfully, but nonetheless, uh, it's just to say that they have learned a lot of things, and they found that it can increase the overall share strength and stability of the soil by about 40%, which is a lot. It really does improve the stability. But at the same time, it is really important to have the local expertise um, of knowing whether it can work or not. You know, looking at soil type, it's not a... It's a it's called a miracle plant sometimes, but it's not perfect. It can't be used in all environments. And it requires a lot of sun. So there's a lot of, and if it, it can't be planted in shady places. So it's just to say that it does require that kind of local knowledge, which we try to bring through the education programs, so persons can know how to use it and where to use it. Um, obviously, if your building is about to fall down, like tomorrow, yeah. you need a wall, <laughs> you know? Uh, it's kind of like more like if there's a risk or uh, if you want to protect your properties from long-term damage or things that could happen in the future, it's an excellent preventative, preventative measure. Yeah. I was wondering how do you introduce these communities to the plant and is it difficult for them to understand this green engineering tool and to apply it? Like how do they... Yeah, no, actually, I would say that um, when we work with communities, they really, they really get it really quickly, you know, as in like they, um, it's logical, you know, like it's, it's um, and that's the whole thing is that it's, uh, it's not rocket science, you know, by people seeing this grass and seeing the roots, they can just appreciate and know, oh, wow, like that can work, that can help me, that can protect my property. Um, so in terms of bringing it to the communities, the most important part is actually just um, finding the right partners to work with, uh, persons in the community who are interested and want to be part of it to kind of help facilitate, um, let's just say if it's a presentation you're giving or some type of outreach, you know, that's really important because communities, we have, we have a lot of good knowledge to bring to communities, but I think we all know and it makes sense that, you know, um, communities and they shouldn't, you know, but in terms of, um, taking in, let's just say if you, I just mean to say that it's very normal for communities to not be receptive immediately to knowledge, uh, to, to brand new stuff. And it makes sense, you know, because uh, there's a lot of stuff out there that doesn't make sense for them that's being brought probably to them, you know. So it just, um, yeah, I guess it's, it's just really about finding that that uh, social connection to be able to bring it. But once you do it, then uh, it's really well accepted and generally we've found that the knowledge can get integrated into communities quickly, and then they can start to sort of know about it and share it with neighbors and friends and stuff so it can start to spread. But it does take a lot of effort to kind of do it properly. That's why it really is a kind of a social approach, this kind of Vetiver education empowerment project mo model that has X amount of steps in order to kind of do it properly. You kind of need to follow it, and we've learned over time it's been refined. Um, doesn't always, you know, uh, well, it just depends. There's different elements that could make it easier or harder and that kind of thing. There's, I would say it doesn't always work perfectly, but if you follow it properly, you know, it generally would work successfully, yeah. Seeing someone at the back. Yeah, um, just curious if you could, <coughs> I might have missed this, um, I'm curious if you could share a little bit more about the state of uh, nature-based solutions as a, as a movement and also as a kind of policy recognition by the, the government in Canada. And then yeah. also, uh, and it seems latent in the model that you're talking about, but if you can talk a little bit about what community-based climate adaptation planning looks like. Are there spaces for communities to come together? Not necessarily just to discuss things like erosion and landslide, but more broadly, spaces where, I suppose, these conversations about reforestation, regeneration, and um, adaptation can come together. Yep. Yeah. Thanks. Great question. So, yeah, so nature-based solutions is specifically another, um, that's like another term, so to speak, that's being really kind of recognized and promoted at the, at the international level, which is really important, you know. Um, I guess the UN, as it tries to focus on climate action and all the key summits and that type of thing, they try to identify what areas need to be promoted and supported the most. 
And like the ecosystem-based adaptation, which I mentioned earlier, um, NBS, Nature-Based Solutions, is another key thing that is being promoted. Um, and so Vetive is an exact, it, it's, a, it's a good example of that, of a nature-based solution, you know. Mangroves is, of, of course, another one, and, and uh, forests, trees, watershed, they all represent uh, value that's being brought back to eco ecosystems and nature. If you have a watershed that, um, like if you have a big area of land that does not have anything growing on it, when rain falls, it erodes, it washes out, um, very little water goes into the ground. But then by getting sort of a big, uh, the whole area is restored, then you can actually start to actually measure and quantify the volume of water that's going to be captured and fed into municipal systems and that type of thing. So anyway, I'm, I'm just using that as an example of saying Vetive is a pretty exact, easy to follow example because it's a plant who is a land and that type of thing. But forest is another example of a nature-based solution. Um, and so broadly, there is a lot of promotion and support at the international level for nature-based solutions. And it is really, really important. Um, so. I don't know if that answers your question, but I would say Vetiva definitely falls in that category of being a nature-based solution. And, uh, with, and, and it definitely is also a tool for climate adaptation uh, with regards to communities. I mean, it's an example of with the increasing weather events, you know, more extreme um, flooding, rainfall, um, that example of Dominica, the 10,000 landslides that would have taken place during Hurricane Ma Maria. If communities have these solutions and are able to plant up in their communities and have this vetiver grass, then they're more resilient. You know, it's, they're more able to adapt to climate and that type of thing. But yeah, so but yeah, even just going back to the question that kind of Lawrence asked, I mean, that's with regards to the community uptake. That is really key and critical for for it to be successful at all. You know, um, there is there is. Um, there's knowledge, uh, like there's, the, there's the, the knowledge that the plant can do this, but if it's not adopted and used in the right way, then it's not, it's not really being used and it's not, you're not getting the benefits of it, you know. Um, a really important example is Haiti, actually. So Haiti was the second biggest producer of vetive oil in the world at some point. I think, uh, I think we brought today, we have a little handicraft and a little vetive oil and you could smell the roots as well. Um, it's a nice fragrance. But so Haiti actually used to be the second biggest producer of vetive oil in the world. Um, what's very interesting is in Haiti, vetiva is seen as, the as a cause of erosion. It's not shocking that this plant that's used for all these things is seen as a cause of erosion. When I heard that for the first time, I was like, what? Like, how is that possible? But the reality is that, you know, in Haiti, uh, conditions are very difficult. And due to the kind of extreme poverty and so on, every plant is seen as value. And people see that you know, if they could extract those roots, those roots can be um, sold for, to be used for vetiver oil. So if you picture digging up all these roots all the time in a very unsustainable way, then suddenly the solution can kind of become the problem. So it just really goes to show that that human element of understanding and integration of it is so important for it to have that kind of value and be successful, you know? Um, so we've actually kind of seen Haiti as a bit of a, a big fish in the Caribbean in terms of, a, you know, we're taking it to other islands, but it's a place that could be immensely beneficial in terms of restoration of their landscape. Um, but it's a, you know, but it's a big one. And to do that, you know, you'd really need to think carefully about how you do it. Uh, we have thought a bit about that, but uh, just recognizing that there is the, the recognition that this plant could be money, you know, and then you wanted to take it out of the ground, you need to really think about how do you bring all those other benefits to the community where they can see, okay, maybe they can make handicrafts as well. Um, we know that there's a lot of reforestation, uh, sorry, deforestation there for charcoal, mm -hmm. but the leaves can be used to make briquets, so fuel briquets. So you can explore making, um, making briquets, you know, and, and if they can recognize it, wait a minute, okay, I can still plant X amount of rose, um, but I would only take out some and leave some, then that would, uh, would sort of allow the erosion to be protected, the land to be protected, while you're producing, whether it's producing crafts, fuel briquets, and that type of thing. Um, I guess the last thing I should just mention, uh, it's, it's, it's funny, I didn't mention this before, but so vetiver grass, I guess the big difference between vetiver grass and the vetiver system, so there's knowledge about vetiver grass, but the vetiver system is specifically a system that's been promoted now, um, 
at the international level by an organization called the Vet of a Network International, which is a, a global nonprofit that's been kind of promoting this for about 30 years. And it's really about the correct implementation of vetiver grass to achieve these benefits. So, so, you know, a single plant might help, but if you have, uh, I guess the big thing about the vetiver system is planting in hedgerows, so continual lines, you know? Um, and that's because if you have a plant that's um, just one plant here, one plant here, one plant there, then the water can still run down and erode in between it and take soil. And uh, so you're still getting full erosion, you're not getting any of those effects. But by having these hedgerows on contour, when water hits it, it's forced to spread out, it slows down, it can promote groundwater recharge, captures topsoil, also becomes a um, sort of a, a tool in, in, a, in natural reforestation and so on. So in that sense, if it's used in Haiti correctly in that way, you know, those types of hedgerows on contours could help to restore the landscape and um, they would be able to use it uh, to sort of still probably benefit from using the roots for the oils, but, um, but really, I guess, we need to do it sustainably. So that was a bit of a long answer. Uh, thanks for your attention. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but yeah, it's just really to say that the community sort of involvement and, um, and uptake of it is really one of the most critical things for it to have that value. Uh, first of all, thank you for sharing this very interesting process and technology with us. And it also, apologies for arriving late. We're not from Montreal, so it's a part of Montreal that we're getting to know now. Uh, the question is, to what degree or in what way do you incorporate indigenous knowledge into this technology and this process? Thank you very much. Um, and also, I have to say, don't apologize. Thank you for coming, because I know that you guys drove all the way from Ottawa. Is that right? Um, but... Uh, yeah, so actually, it is, it, we, it is actually considered indigenous knowledge. Like in and of itself, the vetiver grass is kind of, it's, it's considered indigenous uh, because it's been used um, in the Caribbean, or I should say it was originally kind of introduced there over 100 years ago. It's originally from India. Um, the history sort of first records of it go back a long time, like 5,000 years. And that's, but that was really because of the roots and the fragrance of the roots and the essential oil making. But it did begin to sort of get recognized for the deep uh, root system and its ability to hold land. Uh, we think about 200 years ago, um, and it was brought to the Caribbean then. So there, there, are, there are remnants of it. And in places like Dominica, where we've been, uh, you can still see patches of it at the side of the road. But it would have been these big sort of, it would have been cut down in the past when they're making the road bigger, you know? So those insulations would have been removed. Um, in Trinidad as well, similar stories. They do have a, along some of the old highways like 70 years ago. But, um, but it, you know, in terms of the work we've been doing has been directly engaging with um, ministries, you know, so ministries of agriculture, uh, transport works, that type of thing. And their knowledge would be, you know, it's some of the older heads, the um, older generation, like they would really kind of remember it, but the younger generation doesn't know much about it. Um, so I guess it's, it really has felt like it's reintroducing, but again, I think the vet of a system, that sort of has really sort of been promoted, I think a bit more in the last 30 years. So yeah, I guess to answer, I guess you're asking about the indigenous knowledge and, and, and um, I'm not really sure where indigenous starts, <laughs> you know what I mean? As in like, there's so much history, but it definitely has been used a long time in the past, 100 years ago and so on, and was lost, you know, with the sort of era of big expansion, development, steel, concrete, and so we're kind of now remembering it and bringing it back a bit, you know? Yeah, um, but it does also, it does work as a, just really important to note that, because people would say like, you're promoting this plant, this one plant, what about other plants? You know, that, that is a really important question. So it is, it's actually certified non-invasive. So if you plant one plant, it stays as one plant, it doesn't spread. And that's really important if you're bringing new plants to ecosystems, you don't want it to take over and cause problems. But if you plant a hedgerow, um, so if you plant one plant, it stays as one plant. If you plant a hedgerow, it stays as a hedgerow. What that does is actually, over time, like if it's on a hill, um, it'll capture seeds. So it captures topsoil, it captures seeds, and you have natural reforestation taking place behind it. So we have a lot of cases of this internationally where you see these hedgerows, and then if you leave them alone, you'll start to see forests coming up behind it. And because the hedgerows, um, well, because uh, so vetiver grass, it requires a lot of sun. 
So over time, when you have a sort of a forest coming up behind it and trees, eventually it, it's actually going to start to die out. You know, so it's like it would have done its process, and then you have natural reforestation taking place behind it. And within 10 to 15 years, it's actually very little because it's all there's a canopy over it. You know, so it's really not at all about this being this one plant and no other. It's really just a tool that can be used for reforestation as well and that kind of thing. You know, and obviously the infrastructure purposes. Um, if you're using it for infrastructure, though, it is a bit more important to maintain it to kind of keep it healthy and not. Um, you know, if you want to keep it sort of functioning in that way, yeah. But uh, I don't know if, uh, did that answer your question with regards to the indigenous aspect? It does, thank you. Cool. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. It was really amazing to hear you talk about everything. Uh, it was uh, very, it's very inspiring. Uh, thank you for the work you're doing in Trinidad. Um, I feel you're contributing for, for a lot in the community and, uh, and also abroad because it's a system that could be transferred to other countries. So it's definitely amazing. Um, thank you so much for coming today. We so much appreciate it. Yep. Thanks so much, Mariette. Uh, it was a pleasure speaking to you. And, thanks, and a big thanks to Age of Union for creating the space for this. Um, and I guess just in closing, I would say, uh, as, as you mentioned, there is sort of space for it abroad. And I guess I would just say, you know, yeah, you know, on, on behalf of the Vet of America International as well, while I'm representing Trinidad, uh, the organizations I lead in Trinidad, the Vet of America International really does make a lot of effort and care a lot about the promotion of this technology globally. They do work in the South Pacific as well. Um, and yeah, so, so just really grateful for the opportunity to share and promote it. Uh, and yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.